welcome to our full steam ahead session with Carolyn Kennedy and Chantal Chagnon. So before we begin, I would just like to uh, do a land acknowledgement. So while we meet today on a virtual platform, we would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. Uh, so Ships to Shores aims to encourage collective introspection about the current relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities as First Peoples, as Canadians, as members of coastal communities, and as people in the marine sector. So a little bit about Ships to Shores. So we connect young people with Canada's marine sector and sailing through arts and culture, workforce development, civic engagement, and history and heritage. So the project has engaged 2,300 plus youth across the country since 2020. And our partner today, Cove, is located in Halifax, and they encourage innovation within the ocean sector. So through their workforce development strategy, they engage in strengthening pathways to careers in the blue economy. So the purpose of Full Steam Ahead is to introduce young people like yourselves to really cool marine professionals, and maybe they will inspire you to enter into a career in the marine sector in the future. And we also want to introduce you to Canadian artists and musicians from across the country. So today we are very excited to welcome Carolyn Kennedy and Chantal Chagnon. So Carolyn is a professor of nautical archaeology at Texas A&M University, where her research focuses on historical ships and shipwrecks of North America. And Chantelle is a Cree Ojibwe Métis singer, drummer, artist, storyteller, actor, social justice advocate, and activist with roots in Muskeg Lake Cree Nation, Saskatchewan. So she has presented at various conferences, conventions, and galas and fundraisers, and she aims to entertain, engage, enlighten, educate, and inspire everyone she meets. So I see we have Carolyn here. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our first presenter, Carolyn. And um, remember that we're always open to questions. We will have a 10 minute Q&A after Carolyn's session. So you can post your questions in the chat or you can just shout them out. Um, and then we will also um, then go to Chantel's presentation. And I know I shared some YouTube links with some of the teachers yesterday, but I think we figured out how to play them on our end. So we will take care of that today. So without further ado, I welcome Carolyn. Hi, uh, can you hear me all right? <laughs> Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I'm late. I thought um, this was going to be on central time and that's where I am, but I am here and we're ready to go. So um, I would like to go ahead and share my screen if possible. And what I will do. Ah, right. I think we can do it this way window. Okay. Um, all right. Does this work for everyone? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. So, hi, um, my name is Carolyn Kennedy, as uh, Mira said, um, and I am a professor of nautical archaeology here um, at Texas A&M University in the nautical archaeology program of the Department of Anthropology. Um, so, first off, I wanted to, uh, when I went about putting this presentation together, um, I kind of realized that there was a bit of a theme as I put my, my slides together. And so um, what my theme ended up being is really, it's, it's all success, at least my success, has really been linked to who I know and the connections that I've made with people um, rather than what I know. And maybe that's a, an old uh, rhetoric that you've heard before. It's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, but I've found that to be abundantly true in my experience. And so as we go through, I'm gonna point out some of those connections because I found them um, particularly interesting. But so um, the first thing I wanted to do is just to talk briefly about what archaeology is. Um, so, oops. So archaeology. Um, the first couple of things I'm asked when uh, I tell somebody that I'm an archaeologist is, "Cool, what's the best dinosaur you've found?" Well, I have bad news for you. Archaeologists don't study dinosaurs, um, and so you can see that right here. No dinosaur bones for us. Um, 
Another thing that people like to say is, oh, great. So just like Indiana Jones. Cool. Um, I mean, that's a little bit closer to the reality. Indiana Jones was, in fact, an archaeologist, but he was a movie star archaeologist. And so uh, not necessarily exactly what I necessarily do. But so what archaeologists do is we study the material culture left behind by humans. Um, so material culture is really simply just artifacts, things that humans have interacted with, things that humans have made, created, um, and, and used in their culture in some way or, or another. And so we study the objects that survive, which means that there are many objects that don't survive. We also study the sites that, where they survive. Um, we study the soils, the chemistry of the objects, and uh, all of these things we study in an attempt to tell stories. What we're trying to do as archeologists is tell the stories of the people who have existed before us. Um, peoples of all different cultures and try to understand how they lived and what their lives were like, and in a way to try to understand our own lives and where we've come from in that sense. So um, with archeology, span the, the best type, archeology span is often considered a science um, and good science starts with a question. When you do scientific Inter, uh, investigations, the best thing to do is start with a question. Um, and so this is in fact how my subfield of archaeology, nautical archaeology, came about. In the 1960s, so now almost uh, 60 years ago, over 60 years ago, there were these sponge divers in Turkey. So you can see on the bottom right of my presentation what a sponge diver might look like. This is a modern guy in Florida, actually not a guy from Turkey, um, but you can see all the natural sponges behind him. Sponges are, are pretty, uh, so, are sold everywhere. People like to use them as actual sponges. Um, and so there was a big industry for that in Turkey in the Mediterranean Sea. And while he was diving for sponges, he came across amphora, a big pile of amphora. And amphora are those big old looking jugs that you can see on the upper right. Um, and it's the, the specific name for these uh, Greek and Roman jars that were equipped to carry all kinds of things like olive oil and wine and um, grains and everything that would have been transported back two to 3000 years ago in the Mediterranean. So this sponge diver comes across this pile of amphora and he reports this to an archeologist who is working nearby. And the archeologist does not know how to scuba dive. Um, so he, is re he relied on the sponge diver to tell him everything about this site that happened to be underwater. So instead of trying to do this middleman situation, he suggested to a graduate student at the time, doc a, a man named George Bass, hey, if you go ahead and learn how to scuba dive, um, you know, you can run this project on this shipwreck that we found based on the cargo that it was carrying. And so that's what George Best did. He was studying Mediterranean archaeology. He was really interested in amphora. Um, and he, uh, he, he went to the local YMCA and took a couple of lessons in scuba diving um, and went off to Turkey and started excavating a shipwreck that was 3,000 years old. Um, and through that, he founded what we know now as the field of, of nautical archaeology. Uh, and he actually founded the Institute of Nautical Archaeology, which ended up here at, in Texas at Texas A&M University, which is why this program is here. So here you can see some of the finds that they were discovering. Um, up in Cape Gelidonia. This was, you can see the, the diver is actually walking barefoot, so his fins didn't disturb the site, uh, and they were bringing up these amphora to study them better on land. So my journey. Um, my journey begins in the summer of 2009. I was already a student learning about archaeology in university. I was really interested in archaeology. I had figured out my path somewhat later. I didn't know my path in high school. I didn't know I wanted to study anthropology and archaeology in high school. By the time I reached university, I took a couple of classes and realized I loved it. This was for me. Um, and so I decided to take a bunch of archaeology classes. And then in an unrelated instant, 
instance, a friend and I decided to take a trip through the maritime provinces of Canada. So we went through New Brunswick and Nova Scotia and uh, Prince Edward Island. We didn't get to Newfoundland, unfortunately. But while we were in Halifax in Nova Scotia, we went to the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic, um, pictured here. And while we were in there, again, I was already studying archaeology, we saw this exhibit on the left uh, with a diver who was studying archaeology, but underwater. And I saw this and I realized, wow, this is going to be the coolest possible thing that I could do if I were able to apply my archaeology training and then also do this underwater, talk about discovery and exploration. And so that's what I decided to do. Uh, and so I, what I did was I went back to, after our trip, we enjoyed our trip, we had a great time, we went to many other places, not just museums. Um, but I went back to school the following year and I talked to my professor and my professor said that if I was really serious about nautical archaeology, then I had to do two things. First of all, I had to get field experience. So I had to actually go out and do underwater archaeology to see if it really was for me. Um, and so the way to do that was to enroll in what we call a field school, which is just a school that's set up to have people out in the field, as we call it, doing an actual archaeological dig with people there to train us in the correct methods. Um, and so in order to do that, I had to learn how to scuba dive. So that's what I did in 2010. Um, another thing that she told me to do was that I would have to most definitely go to um, graduate school and the best graduate school for nautical archaeology was at Texas A&M University, which was very surprising to me because I don't typically think of Texas as underwater um, adjacent. Um, as it turns out, there is a little bit of a coastline in Texas, but that has nothing to do with why we're here. Uh, and we're not actually that close to it. It's about a three hour drive from where I am right now. But so those were the two things that she assigned me to do. So the first one was the easiest to tackle, which was learn how to scuba dive. I went to a local dive shop in Montreal, which is where I was from. And in 2010, I enrolled in the scuba diving course. As it turned out, the uh, location that the dive was to happen was right next to my hometown of Shattagi in the uh, Mohawk Ganawage Reserve, where there happened to be a, a quarry there. Um, so you can see just the tiny blip on the map, I believe, here, uh, and how close it was to my, actually ha my actual house. Um, so very close by. And... Um, so I went to dive classes October of 2010 in Montreal, which you might imagine is very, very cold. It was indeed very cold, but I learned how to dive and I was really excited. And then I quickly, per my professor's advice, found a field school that would teach me how to do underwater archaeology on an actual underwater archaeological site. Uh, and that field school was called Sanacera. And this is a Roman port, an ancient Roman port in a place called Menorca in Spain in the Mediterranean. So you can see Menorca here right in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea and up close. It's one of these beautiful, gorgeous islands uh, right in the middle of the Mediterranean. Um, and I was lucky enough to enroll in 2011 for this uh, three weeks in the summer. We did some incredibly beautiful dives here. Uh, and you can see some of the methods that I was taught. Well, not only was my diving improved because of this, I was a brand new diver, but I got to a lot of experience doing this here. But um, in the upper left, what we were doing was called a circle survey. So to search for artifacts underwater over a small space, what if you dive in a, a pair, one person stays put and another person uh, has a line attached to that person and they swim in circles around them, increasing the size of the circle with every pass. And that way you can cover a lot of area and make sure you don't miss anything. I also learned how to take notes underwater. Um, I learned how to use a metal detector underwater. I learned how to measure features underwater, just like you can see in the on the right hand side. Um, and this was a wonderful three weeks. I made a lot of great friends here. I decided that this was absolutely for me. Um, and so following this field school, uh, I actually did apply to graduate school. It was my final year um, of university. And so I decided to apply to graduate school at Texas A&M University. Unfortunately, I was not accepted my first year. So um, it was a, a bit of a shock and a sad thing for me. Um, so 
While I was still waiting for acceptance news, however, I was still keen on nautical archaeology, and I found another field school, this time at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. The Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, as you can see, was also actually quite close to home for me, um, just two hours away driving in Vermont, and this was the lake that I had spent my summers on because it's so close to home. Uh, my family had a place here, and so I was very connected to Lake Champlain already. Uh, and when I saw that they were offering an underwater archaeology field school, it seemed to fit really well. So as I applied for this field school, I found out the bad news that I was not accepted to graduate school, but I decided this was still something I wanted to do. So I continued and pursued the field school. The field school is wonderful. I learned a lot more um, about actual ships and shipwrecks, whereas in Spain I had learned how to do underwater archaeology underwater. We did spend some time underwater in Lake Champlain as well, but we also studied the intricacies of how ships are built, which is a big component to nautical archaeology. Um, so I spent two weeks doing this, and while I was here, I made some great connections, and this is where my theme comes into play. Um, my great connections included uh, the director of the museum, whose name was Arthur Cohn, who came by the field school. He was not running the field school, but he came by, um, and while he was there, he mentioned that they had uh, several programs, one of which included um, the Lois McClure, the Lois McClure is a replica canal schooner that the museum built in 2004, uh, and they built this boat by using plans that underwater archaeologists had taken from two shipwrecks that were almost identical, that were then pieced together to, because they weren't complete, they're were both shipwrecks. Those plans were pieced together so that they could actually build up a ship exactly the same as those two underwater shipwrecks. And so this is what they did, and in 2004 this boat was launched and it uh, sailed through the Lake Champlain but also the canals. And so there is a network of canals connected to Lake Champlain which lead to the St. Lawrence River, which lead to the Great Lakes, which lead um, down to the Hudson River through New York City. And throughout the years this canal replica schooner would sail through those different channels and be uh, interacting with all of the different port cities along those places. So this was still the summer of 2012. I had just received news that I wasn't accepted to graduate school. Um, I ended up working on the Lois McClure in the fall of 2012. So instead of going to school, I was working on board this historic ship, which was fantastic and one of the joys of my life to this day. I ended up working on board uh, the Lois McClure for three whole summers and it was my favorite, again, one of my favorite experiences that I've ever had. But the director of the tour here was this man, Art Cohen, who as I said was the director of the Maritime Museum, um, who during, the, he took over this Lois McClure tour during his retirement. So um, I met Art and we worked together and uh, as it turned out, Art's best friend um, was a man named Kevin Chrisman, who happened to work at Texas A&M University's nautical archaeology program. So the following year, with his encouragement, I reapplied to the nautical archaeology program. So the lesson there being, don't take defeat the first time around, right? So I reapplied, and I was submit. I was admitted. Um, largely because of Arthur Cohn, um, who was my, my good friend and could speak well on my behalf. But so I was admitted to the Texas A&M University Department of Anthropology, which houses the Nautical Archaeology program. I became a graduate student, uh, and here you can see I ended up working again with Arthur Cohn and directly with his best friend, Kevin Chrisman, who became my advisor and helped me through um, graduate school. So, here we go, excuse me just a second. When I entered the nautical archeology span program, uh, Kevin decided that he would be my advisor um, and he already had in mind an idea for uh, a project, for a research project that I could pursue on my way to get a PhD. The research project that he had in mind was studying the Shelburne Shipyard Steamboat Graveyard. Uh, and this was an area in Lake Champlain 
Um, so you can see here, Lake Champlain, this 180 kilometer long, almost exactly north to south lake between Montreal and New York City. Uh, this formed a big water highway in 200 years ago when they didn't have very good roads. So lots of people would be transported um, by way of steamboats through the lake on this very common trip from Montreal to New York City. Um, and you can see if you look there, the Saint Jean, uh, the excuse me, the Richelieu River actually runs here from the Saint Lawrence to the northern end of Lake Champlain, and then the Hudson River takes over here and runs uh, north to south from the southern end of Lake Champlain to New York City. So it creates a continuous water highway, which is what people were interested in, and because of Lake Champlain's unique location and, and all of this water highway, they were a great place to have passenger steamboats during the 1800s when people got around by steamboats. So passenger steamboats would have looked something like these two here in my examples. Um, and specifically what we wanted to look at from the archeological standpoint was where these steamboats uh, were operated out of, where they had been built and where they would have ended up retiring if they didn't shipwreck during a catastrophic event, which was not typical on the lake. And so looking at just this section of the lake here, right in the middle in the widest point, you can see if I blow that up, um, the city of Burlington, Vermont is here. And then there's this really lovely uh, bay called Shelburne Bay that creates almost a nice enclosed safe space for ships to sail in. Uh, and then in red in this tiny little inlet is where our focus was because this is where the Shelburne shipyard was located. So it's still located there as it turns out. This was a picture from 2014 and you can see there's lots of recreational sailing ships and motorboats there. Um, but this is what it looked like in the 1850s. This was where they deposited all of the old steamboats that were too old to be any use to anybody anymore. Um, and interestingly enough, from our archaeological standpoint, if you were to zoom in, and unfortunately this doesn't work anymore, they've changed the satellite, but on Bing Maps, if you were to zoom in on the satellite on this particular area, you could actually see in the satellite photos four shipwrecks right in these shallow waters of Shelburne Bay. And so um, this was the focus of my research. I wanted to uh, do a couple of things here. Again, good science starts with a question. So um, my big question was, um, what shipwrecks are these? We don't know. We didn't know the identities of these. And so uh, in addition to that, how were they built was another big question. To figure these things out, we did a couple of things. We had measuring tools that we used to measure the timbers and put it all together into a big map. I have some of these measuring tools here with me. Um, so just to give an idea, we had these very handy things for underwater research, especially these are long measuring tapes, but they're plastic. And so uh, they survive well underwater, which was very nice. We have these things, which are bendable. Um, the brand is called Rhino Rulers. And these are great when you're diving because they're easy to carry in the folded uh, like this. And then you can unfold up to six feet to measure some of the smaller features. And then we also had things to measure angles. This is called a bevel gauge. So you can unscrew the vise and you can actually measure a perfect angle by locking it into place along two pieces. And then we had another thing, this is a fun name. This is called a goniometer uh, and that's pictured there as well. And this actually measures angles like a level, but it provides a digital number. So if you wanted to recreate any curves, um, you could use this to get the angles for the curves. In addition to our measuring tools, we had to be able to write down the measurements. And so we took a lot of underwater notes. So our underwater notes, you may be asking, how do you take underwater notes? Um, what is, you know, paper obviously doesn't survive underwater. So we have this interesting material that's called mylar here. And so what you can see, it's just, plastic paper, and so it doesn't disintegrate underwater, right? What we did with this was, as you can see pictured, 
um, we had it taped to our clipboards. And with our clipboards, we had pencils. Uh, typically, mechanical pencils were best. And with those, we could actually write on this and take our notes from our measurements. You may also notice that our pencils are tied to our clipboards. Uh, that's because if you've ever held a pencil underwater, if you're you know, um, 20 feet under the surface of the water and you are writing something, and then you want to put your pencil down to take another measurement. If you put your pencil down, it's not going to go down. It's going to go up. <laughs> and now all of a sudden your pencil's up at 20 feet above your head and you can't reach it anymore. So that's why we tie our pencils to our clipboards. So taking these underwater notes was a lot of fun. Um, we spent three years on this site, three seasons, I should say. Um, between three and four weeks each season. And we had many people working with us, lots of student divers. Um, and we had lots and lots of notes that ended up together in this. Um, the thing about underwater notes, however, is that if you've ever tried to look at something underwater, you may notice that it looks a little bit funky. It looks maybe very zoomed in or much closer than you kind of expect it to be or much further than you expect it to be. That's because our, our vision is skewed by the refraction of water underwater. So um, a big key detail for us was, oh, am I still here? Okay, yeah. Uh, a big key detail for us was recopying these notes um, because our notes from underwater looked something like this. If you were lucky, if you weren't so lucky, they might look something like this. This is again because things look very different while you're underwater. So every night we would take our notes that we'd been writing during the day, we'd take them back to where we were staying, and we'd recopy them so that other people could read what we had written. From there, those recopied notes actually came back here to where I am, which is our drafting room. Um, and these notes were compiled so that they actually went together. All of these notes that people took over um, 12 weeks of diving on these four shipwrecks, they had to be conglomerated into something that made sense. So that's what my job was as the leader of this project. Uh, I had to put everybody's notes together into some coherent thing. And that's what these represent. So these are the four shipwrecks with all of the everybody's measurements uh, documented and everything drawn to scale so that we could see the actual features of all of these shipwrecks. As you can see here, um, we had four. Wreck four was the biggest of the four of them by a long shot, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, on the actual satellite image, you can see how those hand-drawn notes from our measurements that we took by hand line up with the, the satellite imagery. Um, they line up quite nicely, I, I, I think, if I do say so myself. So um, very successful in terms of data accumulation. Um, so as I mentioned, one of my big questions was, which shipwrecks are these? Uh, through the data that we collected on all of these shipwrecks, I was able to figure out what numbers one, three, and four were very quickly. Number two, however, remained a mystery. Um, and so over, it took me three years to narrow it down to what I believe to be the Phoenix Two. Two weeks before our final season on site, this is when I'd figured this out. I went to a conference and I presented all of this research that we had come up with and I gave the identities of one, three, and four. Uh, we know that these are these wrecks because of the lengths and the widths and the times that they operated and when this shipyard was operating. Um, and so we were able to figure those out quite easily. Number two, however, was in no records. We had no records of it. We could not figure it out. Um, I, through process of elimination, I came to the conclusion that it must be the Phoenix Two. There were two phoenixes on the lake. This was the second one. And in my conference, as I presented my research, I said, we will probably never know for sure the identity of this wreck. But for now, I believe it's the Phoenix too. So that final season, we go back. Um, this is the archival research that I had done to figure out that it was the Phoenix too. Uh, we're directing our final season. Here you can see Art and Kevin in the background. Again, all of our, these connections are very important, right? Um, and this is the uh, final plan of the Phoenix, the one I believed to be the Phoenix too. 
all of everybody's measurements over 12 weeks put into this plan um, to come up with what this site actually looks like. And you can go in and take actual measurements off of this drawing. Uh, there was lots more analyses that went into this. Um, oh, and here actually, if you wouldn't mind playing the uh, first video. So um, we found a few artifacts on this wreck. It was we, our main intent was to find to figure out how it was built and what the identity was. But we did end up finding artifacts, um, some of which were really interesting, and they told us a lot about the people who were on board. Um, we did find uh, quite a lot of, you guessed it, wine bottles, um, especially up in the forward end of the boat where the crew would have most likely lived. And so there are a lot of these wine bottles. This is the only one that's intact. Most of them are broken. Um, but lots of them were stuffed under some timbers there, kind of put out of the way. We found some evidence of some really interesting, uh, you know, people's lives, including, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but this is a little brass pin that we found. Um, we found actually three of these showing kind of how people, you know, people's evidence of people's clothing, which is really exciting. Uh, and then uh, in our second week of our final season, I, you know, I, we had mentioned, I didn't know Phoenix 2 um, for sure, but that was what I suspected at the point. Uh, one of our divers brought up this pile of tools, which had been stashed somewhere and been forgotten. So it wasn't recovered when the, the steamboat was retired. He brought this up um, and we were looking at this really nice, intact, pr well-preserved pile of iron tools. And one of them, um, the one second from his face, was a chisel. And the chisel actually had some writing on it. Uh, and this was pretty interesting. Writing is always a good thing when you're doing archaeology, because maybe you can find out better dates or what have you. So I started rubbing it, and I noticed a B and a PH. Um, and I said, hey, PH, maybe it says Phoenix, ha ha ha. So I handed it off to our artifact guy who was tagging everything and making sure we knew exactly where on the shipwreck we'd gotten it. And um, he starts rubbing in a couple minutes later, he says, yeah, it says Phoenix. And I could not believe it. But as it turned out, we ended up finding a chisel on wreck two, which we believed to be the Phoenix. And as I'd said, we probably would never know. But we ended up finding out for sure that this was in fact the phoenix from this chisel that was stamped with the, the letters of backwards S, B, phoenix. And that's this chisel right here, which you can see the, the writing on. Um, and so we still have that. And it has been since been recovered um, with a permit, with permission from the state of Vermont and preserved. And you can see that um, I was a very happy person after that. Um, so. After that, I did a couple of other projects while I was still in graduate school, one of which was a schooner that was found in Toronto. Um, I did a project in the Marshall Islands, which you can see how far away it is. It's one of these tropical islands in, 
five hours from Hawaii by plane. Uh, and we were actually studying two World War II planes that were submerged there um, during the battle, uh, during World War II. Um, here you can see a, a quick photogrammetric model of one of the planes. Um, this is just a nice way to document that. So at the end of my uh, doctoral studies, I graduated, I became a doctor, uh, and with that status, I ended up being able to have a little more freedom with what I could do. Um, and so I ended up going back to my Canadian roots. Uh, at, my family being from Gaspé, I decided that I wanted to investigate the history and archaeology of this very maritime region. Um, so my now husband and I launched a project uh, called the Gaspé Bay Survey Project, um, and we are working on this project. Uh, we started in 2019. We have been foiled by the COVID-19 pandemic, and we have not been able to get back since 2019. But in 2019, we ended up finding um, a couple of shipwrecks, and we are really looking forward to going back to this. Um, and uh, we actually do have plans to return in the summer of 2022, now that most of us are able to be vaccinated against COVID and we can bring students and the borders have opened up uh, and we're really looking forward to getting back here. Um, so I think this is a good place for me to stop um, and I will let Chantal uh, can have her time. Well, we can actually do um, questions now. So I was thinking maybe if we do questions until 1.50, Chantal, does that work for you? And then we'll move on to your session. Awesome. Okay, so we have a question from Miss um, Blaise Jones' class. Um, have you ever found treasure? <laughs> so I like that question um, because it allows me to address something that is very close to my heart as an archaeologist. As an archaeologist, our treasure is not gold. Our treasure is not silver. Our treasure is not precious gems. It is the stories. It's the information that we can get from the artifacts. And so I have found treasure many times over in the way that I interpret treasure. And the reason that I think that the stories are much more important is because if you were to find gold coins, if I were to find gold coins, and if I got to keep them, what would that mean to you? I would be richer and you would not be. And that would be the end of the story. But with information, I can get this information and I can share it with you. And that's much richer to me um, and to everybody who studies archeology. span And so I, I, that's how I evaluate treasure. Awesome. Yes, I agree. That is definitely a wonderful approach. Thank you. Do you have any more questions from the class? Or Chantel, if you have any questions as well. Uh, actually, I was just reading an article um, about uh, just off the coast of Japan because it's uh, very uh, volcanic out there and it's actually pushed the water level up quite a bit or down quite a bit and that kind of exposed a bunch of shipwrecks from that were intentionally sunk. So when you're looking for shipwrecks, are you finding things that were intentionally sunk or are you finding things that were kind of randomly, you know, to their doom? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Great question. Uh, so the Phoenix 2, as it turns out, was intentionally sunk. Um, it was a steamboat that was built in 1820. By 1837, it was old. The wooden hull was rotted, and it was not worth replacing the pieces. It was better to just build a new steamboat. And so they took everything they could out of it that was valuable. Obviously, they forgot a couple of tools, but you know, it's a lot of stuff on a shipwreck. Um, and so, and they intentionally sunk that one, and that's why we were studying that one. The Phoenix One, which I've also looked at, um, was actually catastrophically, as we call it, sunk. There was a fire in 1819 on board that started in the pantry possibly a candle was left burning, and the fire spread so quickly that while the steamboat was in the middle of the lake on September 4th of 1819, it engulfed the whole steamer in less than 20 minutes. People were running in the middle of the night in their pajamas um, and their nightgowns uh, to the lifeboats, and um, that one did sink catastrophically right in the middle of the lake, and so I have seen that one as well, and so it is really a mixed bag. We see a lot of both sides of that. Another question, do you, do you feel that your work has an impact on the world? Does it bring you joy? I do think that my work, uh, and maybe my, not just my work, but my and my colleagues work does have an impact on the world. I think the more archeological investigation into history, the better we can really tell stories that weren't necessarily told. Um, so I think that 
the, the benefit to archaeology is if you think about who wrote history, the people who have written history in the past are the winners. Um, so if there's ever been a battle, if there's ever been a war, the winners of those wars are the ones who control history. Archaeology can really set the record straight in many cases. In some cases, it can also uh, corroborate a story. It can add evidence to the story. Um, and so I think archaeology as a whole is changing the world in that way. I think we're adding to the story, especially from voices and, and also histories, not just by the winners, it's people in power, it's those who are literate, um, which isn't everybody. And so a lot of um, underrepresented communities in the past were not literate. Um, women were not literate often in the past. We have very few accounts from women. We have very few accounts um, from historical accounts from people of lower socioeconomic status. And so their stories are really told through archaeology rather than a history textbook. Uh, and so I, that's why I think the work that I do is important and it does ultimately change the world. And yeah, I, I think a big part of that brings me joy. And of course, you know, diving on interesting shipwrecks is also really fun. Uh, <laughs> so. so. I have a question. Yeah. Um, what is the most difficult part of being a nautical archaeologist? The most difficult part is um, actually kind of answering that question that I just answered, um, but in a way that allows for funding. Um, a lot of, there's not a lot of funding for uh, archaeology and, um, you know, doing excavations on shipwrecks can be expensive. And it's interesting to think about because there's not a lot of archaeology money out there, but to do a, a full excavation of a big shipwreck site over 10 years would probably cost about the same as a mile of highway, just to put that in perspective. Um, and so we can measure our archaeological funding in feet is one, something a colleague of mine loves to say of, of freeway, um, a feet of freeway. But so finding funding and finding the support um, is a big part of the, the difficulty. A little more fun part of the difficulty, that's obviously boring stuff, but the funner part of the difficulty is really um, finding, figuring out what to do with the shipwreck once it's been studied. This is very specific to nautical archaeology. Um, if you are to uncover or excavate a shipwreck underwater, the reason that it survived so long is because the preservation properties of the sediments that have covered it have kept the oxygen out and therefore kept any marine organisms uh, from eating away at the wood. Um, and so the second you uncover that, you have now disrupted that whole environment that was preserving the shipwreck. And that becomes the challenge of what do you do with the shipwreck once you've touched it, once you've uncovered it. And that can be, again, also very expensive, logistically difficult. Raising a shipwreck is very rarely done because it's so expensive and so difficult. Um, just logistically, we don't have a ton of tools and machinery that can lift a whole shipwreck out of the ocean. Um, so those are the challenges when we talk about nautical archaeology, for sure. Actually, I was going to ask that if you often remove them from the water and put them in a museum or something, but I guess not. Um, another question is, which do you prefer working in, fresh or salt water? That's a great question. Ooh, I'm not sure that I have ever really thought about a preference. Um, I, there's, a, there's good things to both. Fresh water, I'll give you the pros and cons. Um, you don't have to worry about salt in your equipment and you don't have to worry about feeling sticky after. And uh, also the preservation of artifacts tends to be a little bit better in most cases in fresh water. And so we do have that kind of a balance. The problem with fresh water is it tends to not be quite as clear as the salt water in the ocean and the sea, you can see a lot further when you're underwater. And in the Lake Champlain, for example, we'd have days where we were lucky if we could see this close to our face underwater. Um, and so that's the benefit to working in salt water is you have these really beautiful underwater landscapes, the fish are pretty, the, the seaweed is much prettier. Um, and there's also more likely going to be very large and complex shipwreck remains um, that maybe tie in more cultures, whereas in a lake or a river, it'd be more regional. So there's definitely pros and cons. Um, I think if I had to choose, um, it'd be tough, but I'm, I'm leaning towards salt water just for the more interesting stuff to see. Awesome. So I think we have time for one more question. So if there is a more question, please put it in the chat. Otherwise, feel free to um, share some questions with me via email, and I can also um, send those towards Carolyn if there's other things that you think about after this presentation. 
Let me see. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so now we will head to Chantal and her cat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Carolyn, um, for you. such a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. I'm sure the students did. I had no idea about writing notes underwater. It didn't even occur to me that that's <laughs> you would have to do. Um, but so thank you so much for that. And I welcome Chantal to start with her session. Thanks so much. Sorry, he's kind of in my way. But <laughs> I just wanted to start by um, welcoming everybody today. Um, I am in Treaty 7 territory, which is uh, in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, even though I am from Treaty 6 territory, I always acknowledge the land upon which we stand before I get started. Because if you don't know where you are, then how do you know where you're going? Uh, this is the home of the Treaty 7 people, the home of the Blackfoot of Siksika, Gainai of Agani, the Sarsi Dene from Tsutsuna, and the Stony Nakota from Morley, which includes Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. I'm Cree from Muscat Lake Cree Nation. I'm also Anishinaabe and Metis, and I'm very thankful and humbled to be able to carry my ancestors with me everywhere I go. Um, I think it's really beautiful that uh, Carolyn shared all that she's been uncovering. I know that archaeology has really been key in um, well, <laughs> uncovering a lot of our traditional histories and stories. We have oral traditions that have been passed down for generation upon generation. But um, it's when we can find these sites that actually validate our traditional stories and our traditional ways of knowing. Um, it's just so exciting. And so this is why I love it when science proves things we've done for thousands of generations, because it makes us look real smart. <laughs> but uh, here in uh, the Blackfoot Confederacy, Treaty 7 territory, down close to the Montana border, there is a, a place where we do the Sundance. So we call them the Sundance Grounds. And we've been doing the same ceremony in the same way for time and memoriam, we've been passing it down through generations, through families, through societies, from nation to nation, from Kainai to Bukani. And it is actually the oldest surviving ceremony in the world that we know of, of any of our uncontacted people. But um, a few years ago, there was actually a flood down in Pagani, which uncovered a bunch of artifacts uh, out uh, in the land. And uh, the elders got together and they decided it was time to invite archeologists in to test the site, to figure out exactly how old these artifacts were and how old the site itself was. Even though we've known for time and memoriam, it has been there. And so our oral history goes back quite a, like thousands of generations but when the archaeologists came in and actually had the opportunity to test the site, they were amazed. After carbon dating everything, they were able to trace the site back over 15,000 years. We've been doing the same ceremonies in the same way with the same societies and families for over 15,000 years. So it really puts that into perspective. When we do the land acknowledgement, that's what we're acknowledging. We're acknowledging that incredible history that is steeped into this land and that continues to this day. And so I wanted to welcome everyone by sharing the Cree welcome song. Traditionally, when we sing a song, we sing in rounds of four to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But this song is a little bit different. We actually sing it in rounds of three. And that's to keep the circle open and welcoming so everyone completes the circle today. Because in a circle, we're all connected. There's no beginning. There's no end. No one is greater or less than anyone else in the circle, just like in the hoop of life. So it teaches us to honor each other for those differences. Because if everybody was exactly the same, the world would be incredibly boring and nothing would ever get done. And so it teaches us to really honor each other for those different gifts that we bring to the table. Um, to really not judge each other, but to just embrace all of the things that we can learn from each other. And so Mia Sin, which is the Cree welcome song, is from the Nataha family from Sturgeon. I'll do that. From Sturgeon Lake Creation, um, which uh, is on the border of Saskatchewan and Alberta. And uh, I honor this family for keeping this song alive because for so many generations we weren't able to. We weren't able to share our songs or our stories, to speak our languages, um, to uh, wear our regalia. So this regalia, this is this is a story of who I am. I wear it to honor my teachings that I share, um, even my uh, Métis sash. It's a story of who I am and how my ancestors have come together in a good way to create uh, me. Um, but it's really, really important just to acknowledge those dark histories so that we can heal from them, move forward, and leave a better world for all of our future generations. And so Mia Sin, it doesn't just mean welcome, it also means beautiful. Me a sin, me a sin, a sin in a, a sin in a, a bit of 
kote ni wagonga hota homa kita skino mi asen mi asen circle today everyone and so I'd like to share um well a couple of songs actually so the first song I'd like to share with you this is the water song and um this song was actually an Anishinaabe song and it was first brought forth by the Ottoman Khoi singers so I'm very very thankful for them bringing it forth um and honoring this in a good way when we look at the water it connects each and every one of us it's uh part of us we are connected through the water. Without water, there would be no life. But also within us, we have that connection of water, which is our emotions. Our emotions are liquid. This is why whenever we get sad or frustrated or angry, or even when we laugh too hard, we cry. We leak from our face because our emotions are so incredibly powerful. They have to get out somehow. So it teaches us to really honor our emotions as they come and honor that ebb and flow of our emotions, just like we honor the way that all of the water on earth ebbs and flows. Um, when I first heard this song, I knew it as the rain song because I could hear the rain coming down and then the thunder and the lightning. Um, and also that's part of my name. So my name in Cree is she who dances and sings with spirits in a storm. So it makes sense that I would hear the storm. My cousin, who um, her name is uh, River Flowing Woman, she heard the river, so she could hear herself going down the river in a canoe, going over rapids, and then hitting a huge waterfall. And then my other cousin, who lives in Vancouver, so when she learned the song, she learned it as the ocean song. She could hear the ocean rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth, and then the waves crashing. And so we were at a family reunion arguing about what this song was called. Was it the rain song? Was it the river song? Was it the ocean song? And then finally, our auntie, our great aunt, comes up behind us, and she says, What's wrong with you girls? It's the water song. And they were like, oh, okay, it's the water song. So we were all correct. Um, but when we sing it, it's really about honoring that water, honoring the water within us, honoring that ebb and flow all around us, but knowing that we need um, that, sometimes that chaos, it gives us strength, it gives us knowledge, it gives us wisdom. And if we were all, one, if we were happy all the time, we wouldn't appreciate it. Just like we need those um, those hard times as well as those good times. And just like the land, it needs sometimes a little bit of chaos of that storm to really bring life. Sometimes that wave needs to crash against the shore to be able to uncover beautiful discoveries, including uh, earth and in including new life. That river, river needs to flow to be able to bring all of those nutrients downstream and so that we can create that life of spawning fish and all of the microorganisms that live within it. And so this is the water song to teach us how to honor the water all around us and within us. And it goes a little fast, so it starts slow and it builds and builds and builds and builds and then it drops down again.
Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishat niya, he ha niya. Vishat niya, he ha he. Vishat niya, he ha niya. Vishat niya, he ha he. Vishat niya, he ha niya. Vishat niya, he ha he. Vishat niya, he ha he. Vishat niya, he ha he. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. Vishita do ya, do ya day. Vishat niya, niya, niya. Vishat niya, niya, niya. Niya, niya, niya. Vishat 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 niya, niya, niya. Vishita do ya, do ya, do ya. 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 Vishita do ya, do
All of this uh, old nature has something to teach us. Our history has something to teach us. And it's really important to know our uh, place within it and really understand and discover more of those teachings. And so it's really about respecting that sacred breath that we all share because we're breathing the same air as our ancestors. We're breathing the same air as the dinosaurs. Um, but also we're living those same histories if we take the time to learn about them. And so this is the creator song. Uh, this song actually came to me um, talking about reliving history. So uh, a friend of mine shared this song with me. We had done a song exchange. So I had sung on her album, which was hip hop, who knew? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she taught me this song. But as soon as she shared this song, I knew it. I just automatically knew it. I'm like, why do I know this song? I felt like it was in my very soul. And so um, after I learned it, which was quite quick, I went and I brought it to my great aunt um, and I was drumming and singing and she started singing the song with me. And I was like, auntie, how, how do you know this song? She said, how do you know this song? This is our family song. It's been missing for so many years and you brought it home. And so it's just such a gift to be able to recover those histories and to be able to bring them back home. And the stories is really what connects us. And so this is the creator song. sash that I'm wearing. Um, and so the Métis sash really, uh, it was worn a lot by the voyageurs. So if you're in Montreal, you might have recognized it from like um, the, the winter festival, Maple Fest, uh, which uh, is known as like um, uh, Planta Flaché, which is what it's called there. But uh, it's really a story of who we are as Métis people. And so um, there's a huge, huge history behind the sash. So many of the sashes look very different than they do today because they were family sashes. So they had different colors depending on what nation you're from, um, where you came from, from overseas, because of course the Métis are settlers as well as First Nations people. This is why our symbol is 
the uh, infinity symbol. It's two nations coming together to make an unstoppable nation, um, something that continues to go on for time and memoriam. But um, all of the different colors were related to, um, you know, different towns, different flags, different um, tartans, depending on if it was, uh, you know, a family that was from um, Scotland. And so we actually have a big, huge history. The Métis have a huge history with the Scottish, as well as the French, as well as the Irish, because of these sashes. But we would use them during the portage to pull our boats out of the water. Um, when we were lifting heavy loads, it would protect our stomach so that, you know, we wouldn't get a hernia because these things are super, super strong. Uh, these thick ones we would use to wrap our babies in. We would use them for pretty much everything. But the colors represent the stories of who we are. And so the red is the blood that runs through our veins. The white is the spirit that connects each and every one of us. The blue is the waters. Without the waters, none of us would be here. Is the waters that brought all of the settlers here. And it's the waters that continue to help us thrive to trade throughout uh, all of Turtle Island, North America. We have the yellow, which represents the sun that rises every day, which gives us hope for a new day. We have the green, which represents the fertility of the land and the fertility of the Métis people. And then we usually have a um, stripe of orange, which represents that fire that burns within us. And a stripe of black, which represents those dark days that we have to make sure that we honor that history, that honor that dark past so that we never make those same mistakes again. And we never let those happen to anyone else. And so this is, it's, it fills me with so much pride when I wear my Métis sash. And um, it's very, I'm very thankful to be where I am and in the time that I am now, where I can actually share those teachings, where I can share those stories, where I can share those songs and honor my ancestors in a good way. And I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to share one last song with you. This is the traveling song. And this song has traveled, but it's also come back. So this song I originally learned from my elder, Sharon Prue Turner. Um, and when she passed away, I thought I would never hear this song again. I couldn't remember it for the life of me. Um, but I always say everything happens for a reason and everything that's meant to come back to you will. Um, and a few years after her passing, she was really in my heart, really on my mind. Uh, and then I was doing work with um, a, a theater company here in town and they brought a theater, uh, a show from Ontario, um, from the Sault Ste. Marie area. And um, the ladies there were like, hey, uh, so for the end of the show, can you help us sing a song? I was like, sure, I'll teach it to me. And they started singing it and I just started crying and they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I know this song. I know this song. I'm so happy that it came home. And so this song teaches us that all paths will lead exactly where they need to. And sometimes when opportunities cross our path, we have to take them. But also sometimes when we think that uh, something is meant to happen and it doesn't, it's not a don't get upset about it. Just trust that it's going to lead you to the next thing and you'll get exactly where you need to go when you get there. Uh, it also teaches us that every person that crosses our path is for a reason. We have an opportunity to learn from those people, to grow and to really shape and mold who we are, to give us that strength. Both those good experiences and those bad experiences give us strength on our path ahead. And it's the journey that matters, not the destination. So this is the traveling song. Wish everyone well on their journey.
much, everyone. Thank you for letting me share with you today. And thank you so much, Carolyn, for your beautiful insights and your passion. I love it when I see people that are passionate about what they do, because that's really what makes the world special. 